before I get started, I must uh, say, uh, can, can you guys hear me? Okay, before I get started, I must say that some of you may be a bit uncomfortable with my talk today. My talk is on race. And we know race is a very contentious topic, right? For a long time, in particular here in the United States, race has been one of those enigmas, very complex uh, uh, um, set of, set of uh, variables, meaning biology and the environment. And so uh, when you think about race and how uh, human, the human species are, are distributed across uh, the world, um, over the last several hundred years, there's been a lot of discussions in terms of naming these races and what are these so-called races. And so uh, today I'm, gonna, I'm going to talk some about the, uh, the biology uh, of race and how uh, uh, race is problematic in biomedical research, okay? So I say it's problematic because if you look through the literature in biomedical research or in the popular press, we're hit every day with um, these ideas that race predicts disease or race impacts uh, one's health, right? So uh, what does that mean? Does that mean that, for instance, uh, African Americans have a higher risk for prostate cancer or a higher incidence of stroke? Does that mean that there's some biological sort of um, uh, risk factors that uh, the African Americans have? Or does it mean that the environment is playing a role? And so when we use race, it's very difficult to tease apart the risk factors. And so when we, um, uh, in biomedical research, historically race has been used as a crude proxy, a crude proxy for some shared biology, which means the, in the, in the individual, the biology, the genotypes, and the shared environment. And that's SES, uh, diet, lifestyle, different exposures. And so it becomes uh, really problematic when we use race as this proxy. We should instead uh, tease apart those potential variables and study the biology of the, of the individual and study the environment to understand complex disease. One of the ways that we uh, do that is by using what we call genetic ancestry. And so we've been uh, very instrumental in developing markers called ancestry informative markers that are quite useful in um, understanding individual uh, genetic variation as it relates to ancestry. And this is important because genetics is playing a bigger and bigger role in our lives. In particular, in the next several uh, uh, years, in particular the next five or 10 years um, uh, at the most, we will use uh, genetics to better define our risk, individual risk for disease, and also um, which drugs are more efficacious for us as individuals. And so the Human Genome Project was um, uh, sort of ushered in this, this uh, era of genomics. And we know that, what do we know about uh, genetics? Well, we know that we get half of our DNA from our mother and the other half from our father, which is why we resemble our parents in one way or another. And sometimes your mother may say, you look like your daddy, or you act like your daddy, right? And I would say to my mother, yeah, I hope I do. You know, it's supposed to be my daddy, right? <laughs> but half of, for the most part, half of our DNA comes from our parents, each one of them. And we get some shuffling. But within the uh, genome that we, uh, that we have, it's, it's, it's in every cell of our body, there are genes. And those genes code for things like skin color and eye color and hair texture and body height, body weight, but also susceptibility to disease. And as a geneticist, I'm really interested in how genetic variation plays a role in risk for disease. And so here we are now in this era of genetic, what I call genomic ancestry and the, ch and the challenges related to health because in this era, there are some more challenges. We have this technology now, but, and we're, ans we're asking pretty much the same questions with the new technology. And so the, the challenge is how do we use this technology to better assist us as it relates to health? What's one of the biggest challenges? The issue of group definition and membership. What does it mean to be African American? What does it mean to be uh, European American or Native American or Asian American? Those terms um, are kind of fluid. And if you look through time, they change. African Americans, for the most part, have been defined by social legislation in the 1850s, the one drop rule, the rule of hypo descent. You have one ancestor who's black, you're black. That one rule created so much diversity in the African-American population. Even if you think about the gene pool of African-Americans, it's very diverse before that because it's rooted in Africa, right? West Africa. 
But when you add to that all of the gene flow, or what we call admixture, from Europeans and Native Americans, it creates even more diversity in the African American population. So the issue of how do we define these groups continues to be fluid. And the technology is um, interesting because it allows us to assess at the genetic level ancestry, while at the individual social cultural level, you may think you're one thing, but genetically you may be something else. And so this is a, it creates an interesting tension uh, for us because uh, folks have to reconcile the data, the genetic and the environmental data. Can we accurately assess genomic ancestry? How does ancestry relate to skin color and SES? How useful is it for informing us about disease risk? We know that there are certain diseases that are more prevalent in particular ethnic groups than others. Will ancestry help us understand that those differences in risk? And then, of course, the most important, health disparities. Are they due to biological differences? I think for the most part, a lot of them are due to social cultural differences um, and behavioral um, uh, factors, uh, but biology may be important too. And then, of course, when we stop using race and use ancestry, we have to also, um, uh, how do we prevent, prevent ourselves from um, repeating the past abuses of race? And so when we think about complex disease, there's that social component, and then there's the genetic component. And so I want to split up what we call race, uh, the biological and the social, into the ancestral genetic and the biological, meaning the social um, uh, component. Because we can't throw away race, if you think about it. I mean, it's, it's like throwing the, the baby out with the bathwater. While we know that there are no human races, there are um, uh, important um, demographic populations that, um, that are defined by race in the United States. And I think that they could be, uh, it's important to use that terminology as we measure inequalities and, uh, and surveillance. So here we are looking at genetic ancestry. So how do we define genetic ancestry? Well, We've been um, um, uh, involved in de um, developing these markers called ancestry informative markers. These are markers that are throughout the genome and they allow us to um, estimate overall continental ancestry, meaning uh, West African or Native American or European ancestry. An interesting study um, out of uh, uh, Cleveland, um, Ohio, where individuals were looking at, this is in the middle of a big debate, uh, should we just ask people what they are, self-report, or should we look at these markers and type these markers and estimate ancestry? What they found was uh, those individuals who self-reported as white had on average less than 10 percent African ancestry. If you look at this on the x-axis here, you'll notice that those who self-reported as black is a wide range, what we call a wide variance in genetic background and genetic ancestry. And so there are significant numbers of individuals who have less than 50 percent African ancestry. And so that represents that, that um, uh, the, the African-American gene pool, what we call a macro-ethnic group uh, of individuals of diverse ancestries, okay? When we think about African-Americans, if you just think about the physically, the, the skin color, hair color, eye color, uh, and texture, we see a wide range of variation in the population. You also notice Halle Berry up there twice. Uh, <laughs> I, I, won't have, I won't say why she's up there twice. <laughs> But even Barack Obama is considered African-American, right? One of, his an one of his parents is white, the other one is of African ancestry, of East African ancestry. Uh, unlike most um, descendants of enslaved Africans here in the United States, he is considered black because he has an African uh, father. And so you think about the gene pool of all of these individuals, it's very diverse. And that diversity could impact how um, uh, their um, response to drugs are, and then also their risk for particular diseases. But when you group them all together into one and call that a race, it is problematic. I tricked you. He was an African American. That's VJ Singh, the golfer. Now some of you say, well, I can tell who's black and who's white just by skin color. Well, in the United States, race has been used, I mean, uh, skin color has been used to define race, skin color and ancestry, right? And so, VJ is of East Asian ancestry, right? Uh, so he doesn't have any African ancestry. He's dark because of his uh, ancestry uh, in the tropical uh, region. And so when we look at the variation across the world in terms of skin color, we find that populations that are uh, along the tropics, um, 20 degrees north of the equator, 20 degrees south, uh, are the darker 
darkest populations in the, in the world. And so it's important to understand that variation and not sort of just use this, um, uh, uh, this bottle called race when we define these individuals. So what is it about skin color that uh, ties and also separates so many uh, different human populations? Well, these um, specialized dendritic-like uh, uh, cells called melanocytes produce melanin. They are the cells that are in the, um, between the dermis and the epidermis of the skin, and they produce melanin uh, upon exposure to sunlight. And so you can see some of the melanin molecules there. Our lab was, has been responsible for uh, a lot of the um, uh, um, identification of genes that have been involved in melanogenesis, or the production of melanin. And so we've been uh, um, trying to understand how these genes play a role in variation, not just in African Americans, but in populations throughout the world. But back to African Americans. The bulk of the African American gene pool comes from West and Central Africa, from Northern Senegal to Southern Angola. Very diverse populations, diverse um, culturally. Many different languages are spoken, many different cultures and religions, but also biologically. And you can find the vast array of phenotypes and skin colors, hair colors, air, uh, nose uh, shapes uh, throughout these, this region of West Africa. And for the most part, about 95% of the enslaved Africans that came from this area uh, were brought uh, to the Americas. About 5% came from East Africa. And so it's important when we try to understand genetic variation in African Americans, it's rooted in West Africa. And so we have to understand African variation also. But for the most part, this is where we find African Americans. The Crescent South, uh, this is a, a census um, uh, map of African Americans. This is by county. So the darker the, uh, these areas here uh, on the south, that's where we find the bulk of the African Americans. Here's the Mississippi River, here's Chicago and Detroit. We don't find a lot of African Americans out in the middle uh, of the uh, country out west, um, probably unless they're playing basketball or football. I don't know. <laughs> but but um, here out west, we see uh, a, a large number out in uh, um, Oakland. So this is important to understand. As one who tries to uh, uh, study and understand African-American uh, genetic variation. This is also where the bulk of the enslaved Africans came from. So while a lot of African-Americans went up north uh, for better jobs and opportunities, uh, a, a lot of African-Americans still stayed uh, in the South. Look at this. This is where Hispanics are in the United States, according to the last, uh, the, the 2000 census. So one would suggest that there is enormous segregation in the United States. At the macro level, we think about segregation at the micro level, but even at the macro level. So what, what I find also interesting is the Hispanics in uh, the southwestern parts of the United States, the, these are mainly Mexican-Americans, are quite different genetically from uh, the um, Hispanics in southern Florida and in New York, D.C., and Chicago. Those in, uh, out on the w eastern side have more uh, Puerto Rican and Dominican and Cuban uh, ancestry, but uh, according to the census, are grouped together because they speak Spanish, but genetically are quite, quite different. And because of Tiger Woods, we now can say that we are of mixed ancestry in the census, right? And so where did individuals say that they're mixed? For the most part, out west, and uh, in large numbers in particular in Oklahoma. Why Oklahoma? Because Native Americans. And so this is what I mean by the, the changing identities and how when you look at the genetics uh, of these individuals, a lot of them have European ancestry, uh, some have Native American, uh, but for the most part, there is no sort of um, uh, uh, very large numbers of Native Americans uh, among those who self-reported as mixed ancestry uh, in Oklahoma. And so this is a, a plot where, which we're able to, so, so we're able to sort of depict genetic ancestry for these individuals. These dark uh, circles are African Americans, the open circles are European Americans, and you'll notice uh, along the, um, the points of the triangle are the punitive parental populations. But I want to bring your attention to the red square. There are some African Americans who genetically have more European ancestry than some Europeans, but they self-report as black. And so if somebody were to ask me who's black and who's white, I couldn't tell you because there's a reason why those folks said that what they are, and it's because of how they were socialized. I think that's very important to understand too. We look at these Hispanic populations, for, these are Mexican Americans, and you'll notice the Native American European um, uh, um, distribution and ancestry, uh, but these are Puerto Ricans, another group of Hispanics, less Native American, much more West African ancestry. 
So we see, even within the Hispanic population, a very uh, a diverse set of, of ancestries. And so when we look at uh, ancestry, we can actually look at it to the point where um, we can um, assess each individual chromosome and try to determine where these chromosomes came from, arose from, if they were of African ancestry or European ancestry. And we know that, for the most part, genes don't stay in your genes. Anytime you bring two people together, uh, there will be some mixing. And so we can actually look at these chromosomes in individuals of mixed ancestry, like African Americans and Hispanics, and uh, uh, look along these chromosomes uh, marker by marker and estimate um, um, uh, where uh, these segments of their chromosomes arose from geographically. In fact, this is my chromosome. I actually got this uh, test done by a company called 23andMe. And uh, you'll notice that I have this mosaic. So here I am thinking I'm 100% Mandingo. <laughs> and in fact, I find that I'm only about 80% uh, West African ancestry, and I have 12% European and 8% uh, Native American ancestry. So my mother would be quite happy. Uh, she said, she swore that we were Native American. And I said, oh yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, we do have about 8% Native American ancestry. And then we have that 12% there of European ancestry. And so this is uh, the, uh, the interesting uh, situation where when I look at my Y chromosome, it doesn't go back to, to uh, Africa, but it goes to Europe. In fact, it's quite common in, uh, in Germany. And so I'll end there. Thanks. <laughs>